evening, everybody. Elephant in the room here once again with myself, Muihan, and my co-host Taranjit. How are you, Taranjit? Very good, Muihan. Very good. Thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasant day today. Uh, yesterday was really raining, but today is good. So I'm oh. I'm I'm looking up. Cool, cool. So a uh, very uh, good to be back here again once again and today we promise you to have a very very exciting episode uh, but just before we start uh, we'd like to just do a quick shout out to a few friends who are here uh, first I have uh, Catherine uh, hi Catherine hello Mindheart uh, connection member thank you for coming in uh, we also have Zorak Mr. Zorak thank you for tuning in uh, Ben uh, my good friend and as well as uh, Mr. Jack Tan thanks for being Wonderful show just now, Jack. Uh, Jack has a show uh, every day at 5, uh, called Take 5 at 5, right? Just finish that wonderfully. All right. So um, maybe I will just really get into the, the conversation. Uh, so there was a lot of feedback and questions with regards uh, to this idea of uh, restructuring since we were talking quite a bit on uh, retrenchment, of uh, downsizing and right sizing and what needs to be done. So uh, one of these areas uh, which I thought may be good for us to discuss today uh, was this fully focus on uh, restructuring as well as change management, which is one of our, both of our core competencies. But we got to say that it's a very, very big subject. Uh, we maybe just focus on one area particular for today's show. Uh, maybe uh, your thoughts on that, Taranji? Sure, sure. Thank you, Muihan. Uh, once again, always good to be back. Uh, good to see familiar names around the uh, the chat group here. So good, good to have you guys on board again. Uh, one of the main things I took away from the past two weeks um, from uh, from the discussions we've been having, and that needs to be looked at from a business owner as well as a business leader perspective, is the ability now and the requirement to start thinking about cost containment as well as cash preservation. Uh, these are two fundamental areas that will drive business sustainability moving forward. So one area that we are now looking at is, uh, and I think this is a very uh, apt field to look at right now, what does restructuring actually mean for us as an organization? And uh, there are a variety of areas to consider. Uh, and a 15, 20, 30 minute discussion is not enough. This, this is actually more than a day's, if not two days worth of work uh, and discussion in this regard. So. Let us break the journey into three distinct parts. The first one around the pre-restructuring uh, thought process. What do we need to think about before we even start doing anything? Two would be the area around the actual re the restructuring itself, uh, the during part. And the third one will be around the area of post-restructuring. So three areas for us to focus on. Uh, and today, let us look at the first part of it, which is the pre-restructuring part. Um, and there are elements of change management that comes into that. Uh, what does change management do? How do we talk about this? So, Muihan, let's yep. go back to you and ask you, as an expert in the area of change management, what is this and why is this critical at this point in time? I think one of the most important aspects uh, of any initiatives and any projects, uh, regardless whether it's restructuring or it's an IT rollout or even a new culture adoption by organization, uh, the, the element of change management is always, always critical. Uh, that's, that's, that's for sure. However, um, in change, most cases, uh, there, there are either two ways of looking at it. One is uh, we drive it very top down in a way that uh, the senior management just give instruction and certain organization work very well with that. Uh, the senior management just drive the instruction down and uh, people will just adopt it accordingly in that sense. Uh, the other one is um, very much people centric uh, that focus a lot, a lot of understanding the psyche, the emotions, uh, the culture, some of the enablers, and some of even what, what are the things that prevent people from adopting change. And I think that is that is very critical. Now, in particular, when we start talking about restructuring, I think that becomes a very, very important uh, element uh, in any process. I mean, change management in that sense. Because uh, in a lot of cases, uh, the association with organization restructuring tend to be negative. And when you have a negative connotation, 
definitely that arouse a lot of negative emotions. Huh? And uh, that's where, uh, by nature, most of us as human beings, huh, we are very self-preservation, we are very survival-driven. So the moment we feel threatened in that sense, uh, then all our defense mechanism will come up. And therefore, the logical aspect of it becomes very, very challenging. So in my experience over the last 15 years doing change management projects throughout different organizations uh, within Malaysia as well as in the region, one of the common things I find that most organizations uh, don't do enough, I don't say they don't do, but they don't do enough, is to recognize this particular emotional piece in that sense. Because most of the change initiative is always driven from the logical flow. So look at any change methodology they will talk about creating the burning platform selling the benefits and so on and so forth but without really understanding the emotional portion of it uh, which is always the derailer that is where most uh, initiatives fail uh. well done well said and i think the uh, in addition to that and, and this is where the harder stuff comes into play and what i mean by harder stuff is the more tangible where change and change management is to talk about mindset and that whole emotional buy-in, the restructuring piece becomes very clinical. And this is what we were discussing with Hira the other day. How do you manage the clinical as well as the uh, emotional part? So one thing that comes out from my experience, I've been in this field now for nearly 20, 25 years, uh, starting with the, uh, the, and I was fortunate or unfortunate as the case may be, uh, to come in smack in the middle of the financial meltdown in the mid 90s, 97, 98, when the banks were merging, uh, Bank Nagara had issued out the financial sector master plan to collapse 53 financial institutions into the 10 that we see today. Uh, things around the Bakun Dam restructuring uh, and, uh, and the Parwaja Steel taking over in that regard. And those were those were things that I was very, very privileged to be on with a very good bunch of team members working out of Pricewaterhouse in those days. Um, the things that really play out for the first part would be, do we have clarity of thought about why this is being done? And there needs to be an overarching picture. There must be an overarching thought process around the reason behind this. And Muihan mentioned about the, uh, the burning platform. And in my mind, the burning platform is absolutely critical because that then sets the scene, sets the stage. The second one that comes out would be the area of what is the end game. And this is where Darman's point came in. Starting with the end in mind, how do we now start working backwards? And that whole thought process around the end game, the whole thought process around why we're doing it will then lead to in this regard. Muihan, back to you. Cool. So um, I, I, I thought this, this topic is very, very interesting. And maybe I also, I know we have a lot of, lot of friends who are also expert and uh, have gone through similar experience. Maybe I'll just take uh, this moment just to pause. Uh, maybe I'll just call a few more four names to shout out to them, for them to join us, as well as also to invite them to. So maybe for the rest of the audience, what I want to maybe invite you to be part of this process is uh, maybe if you can give your inputs on what do you think about restructuring, what are some of the key things that you think that we should look at, uh, and what are the things that you feel that in your past experience, either you are part of the restructuring or you, are, uh, you, you uh, witness it from afar, uh, what are the one, two things that you thought that could be actually done differently or better? So if you can, uh, please do share your thoughts in the comments section. Uh, as uh, we go along, uh, maybe let's do a few more shout out. Uh, hi, CJ, another MindHeart member. Uh, Dr. Heng is back from Singapore. Yay! Dr. Heng, we missed you yesterday. Uh, Hilson, thanks for tuning in, Hilson. Uh, we also have Mian. Mian, you just did a great show. Love your show just now. Wonderful. Okay, and uh, we also have Kwa, brother Kwa. Nice to see you. Okay, so uh, maybe in that perspective, uh, maybe I want to just go a bit deeper in that sense. I think that thought process in your experience, Taranjit, as you were saying, uh, a lot of times is very much cost driven. Would that be the, the case? Or yeah. is there? A, a different variety to it in that sense. 
Okay, so and that's a really good point. And before we start talking about, uh, my suggestion is when we when we are looking at people to write in, focus on the pre. Ah, yeah. Before we actually go into this, so what are the critical things that we have to put into place pre restructuring? So let's focus on that right now. So coming back to you, um, it's actually very interesting. Progressive organizations, in my experience, have been constantly restructuring themselves. There has been no reason to wait for something like this to take place. They, the, the need for uh, uh, a change, a need for restructure is always taking place. Why? Because the business environment is constantly changing. And if you are comfortable for a little while longer than what your competitors are, you know what? We have already lost the deal here. So where you see restructuring taking place, it's not as big a deal for some of the more progressive organizations. They're always re-looking at boxes. They are always re-looking at structure. And when I talk about boxes, I'm talking about roles within those structure. They're always looking at reframing themselves from a, a functional perspective. How can I now drive cost savings? Uh, even if there was no need from the outside, why? Because that's our DNA. The unfortunate thing today is we are governed very much by an external intervention coming in, which is why everybody is caught unaware. But the progressive organizations are constantly doing this, and which is why they are world's most admired, for example. Muya? So I also wanted to share, uh, since you mentioned that, because I, 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 ma I managed to do some work in a, in a telco company, one of the big ones in Malaysia a few years back. And I, I very, very, I would say I'm, I'm fully amazed with most telco companies. But this, this was really a, a darling in the sense that uh, not only they were progressive, uh, but this is slightly two years, of, two years ago. Uh, in most of their town hall and communications, they already have been sending the message to everyone, not just the senior management team, but to the managers, to the staff, to the working level that uh, their business is almost dead. The so-called voice and SMS business has been dead uh, uh, for five years in that sense. And uh, they are looking at obsoleteness in the safe. So in a way, the, the telco industry, I, I find, I mean, my bias view at least, uh, please, please do correct me, uh, anyone, please, please do comment, uh, have been very, very progressive because the nature of their industry drives them to be sold. And you find that to them, uh, they always adopt change and they always are, are very uh, focused in moving uh, or, or restructuring or changing or reorganization. So I, I, I tend to believe uh, your, your perspective of progressive organization have been doing this uh, since in time immemorial is they don't wait for the, the crush time like this in that sense. No, absolutely. And, and we've got some very good comments coming out from uh, some of our listeners and viewers. Uh, perhaps if you could uh, raise some of those comments and we could address them. Yeah. Um, and, and Jack actually mentioned yeah, uh, managing emotional and psychological part of change is a good way to lower resistance. Absolutely. Uh, and my thoughts here is we need to do this in a proactive fashion rather than it being reactive, in which case we are now running behind, chasing our tails in this regard as leaders. Uh, Dr. Heng raised some, oh, there you go. Uh, maybe you want to comment on that, Muihan? Yeah, I think uh, just to read out, Dr. Heng said, uh, post-COVID change management is not very different from previous time. First step is uh, companies to review and rethink their business. Uh, they will have lost customer as well as suppliers. Costs did not go down, especially for fixed costs like rental and overheads. Uh, many continue to pay salaries. So uh, I feel that uh, this is truly, truly the case. And uh, in this focus is uh, at the moment, I, I really empathize with most business leaders. Uh, especially of this non-clarity and then we'll talk about this in our previous show to say that even you have a BCP, your BCP seems to be agile you know, because it changes by the hour, changes by the day, changes by the week and where do we start uh, focusing in moving forward and uh, I, I, would, I would concur with Dr. Heng uh, in, in a lot of sense that uh, this is the time where I think the hard question need to be asked in the business uh, leadership to say whether do we change the model entirely or do we tweak it to uh, suit the new normal i think that is the hardest question to start because 
if it's just a matter of tweaking it to to know to look at the new norm uh, that will be a less painful uh, process or even less riskier but i think there's a hard question to really ask and i think many business leaders are asking that now do we change our business model entirely from the segmentation to the focus to the sub verticals and so so forth what do you think on that uh, taranjit yeah which is which is what raised my point earlier the planful approach has to be there uh, looking at it from a perspective of uh, vision and mission uh, and this is more so from an operating model but i would like to take this to another discussion point as we are talking about pre planning not only are we thinking about what the operating model looks like but i now need to have a very clear perspective of what the structure needs to look like why is this because the structure and the different ecosystems and i call it ecosystems where they be the platforms that we are running or where they be the whole thought process of the processes that are in place all these different ecosystems need to be jiving seamlessly and that's where the structure comes into play do i have the right type of people let's not even talk about the people first but just talk about the roles that are required how different are these roles moving forward why do we need this different roles and it's not about job descriptions as an example it's about now driving sustainability given this new very normal that you talked about muhan so i wanted to maybe put that point because i think a uh, qua here raise a good comment uh, he said based on experience management should not assume everyone wants to stay in the new structure and also vice versa and i think this one uh, thing that uh, we were talking about as we were replaying this uh, yesterday show uh, where where we pick up i think uh, was dr heng's comment on on the job stability versus income stability in that sense so i i would uh, really uh, uh, want to have this uh, good discussion uh, qua i think you raise a very good point and i think because of this uh, entire crisis or and this entire moment uh, we also come to terms that we have accelerated uh, the telecommuting uh, commuting we have accelerated the gig workers we've accelerated the adoption of some of this uh, uh, concepts that were fringes of our practice in the in the previously in that sense so you are right uh, uh qua that i think even that we want to change and coming to your question of what would be the structure what would be the role that we are thinking about uh we may not have people that want to do it <laughs> i think that's that's the point right what do you say to that no absolutely and i think it's uh, the term i use is horses for courses and, and you've heard me use that term many times muhan uh, i don't need an arabian stallion to plow a, a, a field and likewise i cannot use a plow horse to run a race so but both of them are required in their respective roles the question now comes in is if there's a shift in a role and i tend to agree with the uh, comment that was raised what happens to individuals who feel that they do not want this new role and quite honestly i think that the 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 decision is out there to say the organization is moving are you on the bus or not and we are not going to stay back or we are not you know hold back simply because two people feel very uncomfortable about this this now needs to be relooked at from a people perspective and we'll talk about that in another segment that talks about the during part uh, let's yeah. focus on the uh, on the pre part the now pre there's, part. A, there's a bit of a shout out we han there's a there's ranjit who has called in i i truly love these uh, individuals uh, they're becoming a little bit of a family here we now have family coming in from malacca well done thanks ranjit hi so so, want... so to your point yes please uh, please continue we han uh, us answer this question from my friend ben so ben asks since restructuring exercise are ever present in our fluid economy how we then can motivate our employees and sustain them to give their best to the organization yeah ranjit yeah so so this whole issue around sustainability the whole issue around driving engagement is i think where uh, dharma mentioned it is no uh, and this is where leadership is absolutely critical it's not just getting people to do it but it's getting people on board because they want to do it 
they are the ones that are now going to drive the difference. In the good days, we are all sitting down here and you know having a bit of a kanduri. But in the in a, when aw awkward times come in, we all need to tighten our belt. How do I now employ those styles of leadership that will drive the level of uh, uh, fellowship that is required in this regard? I, I do believe, and I'm cognizant of time here in Wuhan, and we still have a couple of uh, other people that we need to address. Uh, I do believe that uh, making sure that leaders, and this, it is times like this that leaders will come across as those who genuinely care for their people and the business, and those who are only concerned about the business, and whether or not they care, that's another issue. And this is where it's going to be quite a tipping point moving forward. Muihan? So I, I really like that, and I, I think uh, for those who have been following me, I, I think I posted uh, this uh, late last night to talk about great leadership. And I think uh, I, I created a snippet of video Daman section uh, on great leaders in, in, in tough times. Uh, this one perspective, I always believe that it's always easy to be a leader in good times. Huh? But it is times like that that really defines one leadership in that sense. And uh, maybe one of the things that I want to, to put it forward, uh, although this is part of the, the thinking process through, I also feel that uh, a lot of times where we try to be strategic and methodological and process driven, maybe one uh, critical area that we business leaders may tend to overlook and, and don't focus enough is that at the end of the day, it is still a very people process. It's a very human to human process in that sense. And I feel that uh, while employees may have a lot of demands and perspective as well, uh, naturally they are still human beings uh, in that sense. So if we are able to create that climate and culture or the environment where we can treat each other as human beings, and I think in, in a lot of Malaysian organization or in our Asian organization, we are, we are still very fortunate to have that kind of uh, respect for one another and uh, uh, focus for one another in that sense. Uh, a lot of times we can actually work together to solve different, different issues. Uh. So, and I, I want to echo even, I mean, we were talking about Dharma's uh, case in that sense is the consent or even things like that. Uh, that is very much people to people in that sense. And, and I would add on to that, Muihan, I think a fundamental core value that we need to be looking at today, especially is mutual respect. There needs to be mutual respect, uh, and that applies. I mean, that's one of the core values I subscribe to uh, when 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 I go out to to market even now. So there needs to be a very clear focus around doing the right thing, and having mutual respect, uh, rather than me dominating and being aggressive in the discussion because that's the easy thing to do. Let me tell you what to do, Mr. Employee. But this is not the, that point uh, that we need to be looking at. I need your help today more so than any time before. And that mutual respect is important. Um, we, we have another couple of uh, shout outs there. Would you want to, uh, to just raise this before we start concluding, Wian? Ah, yes. So uh, I wanted to actually to, to highlight that point by Dr. Heng uh, in that sense, uh, uh, which we talk about, I think, coming off from your last point in that sense, to say that, uh, leadership difference is a uh, matter first post COVID, and uh, I think uh, the notion of suffering together uh, gives that extra trust and bond between uh, the leader and, and, and their people. Uh. And I think that is where uh, I was also referring about uh, the human element to read, right? Uh, there's also a divergent thought, uh, maybe uh, this from Kwa again. So thank you for your participation, Kwa. So Kwa said that there are certain industries are doing okay, if not better during this period, such as the essential industry. These are companies likely need more staff than people from the affected industry and could explore. Uh, so and maybe to this point, I will just put it first uh, in a cognizant of time. Uh, my personal belief that uh, that comes to the personal change mindset that is needed. Uh, and a lot of times, I think we touch upon this uh, when Sharin came onto the show, uh, is when you are very much involved in a certain particular job and task that you've been doing year in, year out. By the time you are let go because of circumstances, you are still very stuck in that nature of chain of thoughts, you know. So in your case, you say, I cannot do anything else except, let's say I'm from aviation, I cannot do anything else except aviation because my skill set uh, cannot go into other industries. That is where I think 
individuals need to start breaking their paradigms and i will concur with qua there are certain industry that will be booming uh, in looking at, at the trends but whether does the workforce of those impacted uh, industries are able to switch their mindset to say that hey this is something i can do as well because that's a transferable skill which i can uh, port over maybe some some thoughts to that, then uh, I think we need to close. Uh, time starting No, no, up. You're, you're absolutely right. So, so a couple of takeaways here as we go into this process is uh, two things. One, as business leaders and uh, owners, the whole thought process of having a good strategy uh, to, to operationalize, it becomes critical. Two, the type of uh, outcomes that we're now trying to derive from those strategies is absolutely uh, essential. Three, the type of uh, uh, structure and platforms and ecosystems that we need to have in place to support the execution of the operating model is also critical. That, for all intents and purposes, will be the key areas for discussion and thought during the pre-restructuring timeline. And that also comes into play when we talk about change management. What are the messages and nuances that I need to put across? Muihan, back to you. All right, so we are at the almost ending our show and time really flies and I really like the conversation. Uh, thank you so much, all of you who have participated. Uh, I really uh, value your inputs to join us in our discussion. Uh, just wanted to say that uh, for tomorrow's show, we are having a very special guest. Just let me pull out his uh, visual very quickly. Okay, so uh, for tomorrow, we have uh, Mr. Param Sivalingam to join us for Elephant in the Room. Just some perspective, uh, I worked with Param uh, uh, previously in the MRT Line 2. He was the project director. And uh, Param has about 40 years in the construction industry. Uh, today, he's an independent consultant for the industry. Uh, we wanted to get him on board to actually share uh, more pertinently about the uh, COVID impact uh, or the COVID-19 or the MCO impact to the construction industry. So uh, maybe, maybe Taranji, you can share the structure moving forward after we, con I mean, we, we, we are done with Param, what's next post uh, sure. tomorrow show, yeah. Sure. So, so um, for, for tomorrow, we've got that. And thereafter, we've got um, uh, the area around uh, the implications of uh, COVID-19 on the tech sector, uh, specifically around startups. What are the implications? And we have Sushil Singh coming in from Singapore to talk about that. Um, yeah, a very dear friend, a, a work colleague of mine. Uh, it'll be interesting to hear his perspectives around this from a regional side as well. And on Friday, we'll be looking at things from a an academic, uh, specifically an institution of higher learning. And we have got uh, uh, the deputy vice chancellor, uh, Dr. Uh, Vanita Gupton uh, to be uh, with us and it'll be an absolutely thrilling ride to hear the perspectives of these three individuals in very three different sectors in this regard. So that's it. Uh, that's our plan for the next three days. Uh, we wanted to bring the people on the ground to actually start to share some of their perspective and what is their observation so that uh, at least we are not talking from a very high level uh, things that between what we observe, what we read, what we research. Uh, but we wanted to really know what is happening on the ground and how that impacts them. So with that, uh, thank you once again for tuning into our show. Uh, we already have put up the links for the next two days. Uh, just maybe hit the link, click the Get Reminder button so that Facebook will remind you. Uh, also share that link with your family and friends so that they can tune in, especially those who are in the construction industry as well as in the tech sector. So thank you very much to all our Muslim friends. Selamat berbuka puasa. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.